In the last few videos, I've spent some time discussing the Minkowski metric, Lorentz scalars, and probably one of the most important Lorentz scalars, the proper time. In this video, I'm finally going to introduce four vectors in special relativity. You can think of four vectors as vectors with four components that have special properties. I'm going to define what those special properties are later on in the video. The four components, by the way, consist of a time component and three spatial components in the x, y, and z directions. Let's start by going over a classic four vector, the displacement four vector. We actually covered this in my video on the Minkowski metric, but I'm going to go over it again here. Suppose I have an inertial reference frame R, and that in that reference frame there's an event A that occurs at the origin, so time zero and x, y, and z also zero. I've only drawn T and x here on the space-time diagram representing this reference frame for ease of depiction, but you can imagine that there are also two other spatial dimensions. My light line is once again at 45 degrees because in my space-time diagram I'm measuring my time in light meters, the time it takes for light to travel one meter. If I then draw an event B that occurs at some arbitrary coordinate in space-time given by T, X, Y, and Z, then the displacement 4 vector, which I'll call capital X, going from A to B is just C times the difference in the time coordinates of A and B, so C times T, because A is at the origin, followed by X, Y, and Z, again since A is at the origin, so we can just straight up use the spatial coordinates of B. In my Minkowski metric video, I use delta R instead of capital X for the displacement 4 vector, but in this video my notation is slightly different, so just bear that in consistency in mind. Let's now suppose that I have another inertial reference frame R prime going at a velocity v in the positive x direction relative to the reference frame R. We'll assume that the reference frames R and R prime line up their origins at t equals t prime equals 0. From the point of view of someone in the reference frame R prime, the coordinates of event A are still zero because the reference frames line up and start their clocks at time zero. However, the primed coordinates for my event B are given by the Lorentz transformation equation. So the T prime coordinate is this in terms of the unprimed coordinates, the X prime coordinate is this, and so on with the Y prime and Z prime coordinates. We talked about this when we derived the Lorentz transformation equations earlier on in this series. Note that gamma here is called the Lorentz factor and is given by the following. Now if we want to write these Lorentz transformation equations in terms of vectors and matrices, we can just collect the primed coordinates into a column vector like so, and set that equal to this matrix times the unprimed coordinates which are in a column vector like this. But this vector on the left is just the displacement vector x but in the primed reference frame. Similarly, this column vector on the right is just our unprimed displacement vector x. This 4x4 four four matrix that connects the unprimed displacement vector to the prime displacement vector is called the Lorentz transformation matrix and is denoted by capital lambda. So overall, the prime displacement vector can be calculated from the unprimed displacement vector by using the Lorentz transformation matrix lambda. This is just the vector and matrix way of writing the Lorentz transformation equations, and I'm going to call this equation 1. Similarly, if we want to convert from the primed coordinates to the unprimed coordinates, so the reverse conversion, we can just use the inverse Lorentz transformation equations, which again I first showed in my previous video on Lorentz transformations. Again, gamma is the same Lorentz factor that we've gone over. If I put these inverse Lorentz transformation equations into vector and matrix form, this is what I get. My unprimed coordinates on the left, and this matrix multiplying my primed coordinates on the right. This matrix, by the way, is the inverse Lorentz transformation matrix, denoted by capital lambda inverse. So in terms of capital lambda inverse, the inverse transformation rule for the displacement 4 vector is as follows. You can verify and show yourself that the product of the inverse Lorentz transformation matrix and the Lorentz transformation matrix itself is just the 4x4 four four identity matrix, which is what we want and what we expect. Let's go over another property of the displacement 4 vector, its magnitude. From my video introducing the Minkowski metric, you know that the magnitude squared of the displacement 4 vector, which basically gives you the space-time distance between two events, can be found by taking the transpose of the displacement 4 vector, multiplying by the Minkowski metric, and then multiplying by the regular displacement 4 vector, the column vector. I'll call this equation 2. Recall that the Minkowski metric eta is represented by a 4x4 four four diagonal matrix in which the first element is negative 1 and the other diagonal elements are positive 1 by our established convention. If I now want to write down the complete expression for the magnitude squared of my displacement 4 vector, then in terms of t, x, y, and z, this is what I have. 
You're probably familiar with this as the space-time interval s squared, but there's a couple of important points here. The first is that the space-time interval is a Lorentz scalar. It is invariant with Lorentz transformations like we went over in the previous video. Observers in all inertial reference frames agree on the value of the space-time interval between two events, even if they don't agree on the values of the individual components of the space-time interval. What this means is that the magnitude of my displacement 4 vector is an invariant quantity. This should make sense if we use the analogy of three-dimensional space. In regular three-dimensional space, the magnitude of a displacement vector is the distance. That distance should not change if I change my coordinate system. The length of that vector should remain the same. The same logic applies in four-dimensional space-time. The magnitude of my displacement 4 vector, the space-time interval s squared, is and should be an invariant scalar quantity. Now, just like how my space-time interval can be described as space-like, time-like, or light-like, depending on its sign, the displacement 4 vector x can also be described as space-like, time-like, or light-like, depending on its magnitude. If the magnitude squared of x is positive, x represents a space-like displacement. If the magnitude squared is 0, x is a light-like displacement, and if it's negative, x is a time-like displacement. The same definitions apply to 4 vectors in general, not just displacement. So a time-like 4 vector has a negative magnitude squared, a space-like 4 vector has a positive magnitude squared, etc. So for instance, in my next video, you'll see that the magnitude squared of the velocity 4 vector is negative, which makes it a time-like 4 vector. Sometimes you might also see that instead of describing my displacement 4 vector as consisting of the components c, t, x, y, and z, you might see those components labeled as capital X super t, X super x, X super y, and X super z, or sometimes even with numbers, so capital X super 0, super 1, super 2, and super 3. I should mention that these are superscript indices. They're not powers, they're meant to represent an index. If I wanted to represent a power when I've got superscript indices, I would use parentheses and the power outside those parentheses like so. And for those of you who are interested, the reason the components of the displacement 4 vector are labeled with a superscript index is that they are contravariant components, but I don't expect you to know that right now because we haven't yet gotten into tensors and relativity. So now that we've summarized some properties of our displacement 4 vector, we're ready to now describe more concretely what a 4 vector actually is. A 4 vector A in special relativity is a vector with 4 components, a time component and 3 spatial components, which transforms according to the Lorentz transformation equation in equation 1 when being viewed from a different inertial reference frame, where lambda again is our Lorentz transformation matrix. As a result of following this transformation equation, the 4 vector gains some other properties. One of these is that its magnitude can be found by using equation 2 involving the Minkowski metric, and that this magnitude of our 4 vector must be a Lorentz scalar. It's invariant with Lorentz transformations. You'll notice that our displacement 4 vector x satisfies all of these properties, and so it qualifies as a 4 vector. Now the important thing is that the 4 vector itself doesn't transform per se under a Lorentz transformation. Its components transform, but in the absolute sense, even under a different coordinate system, under a new Lorentz transformation, new inertial reference frame, the 4 vector will still have the same magnitude and the same quote-unquote direction. It's just that the components are written differently in different inertial reference frames, and the way they're written differently is governed by equation 1. Anyway, that should do it for this video. In the next lesson, I'm going to talk about the 4 velocity and 4 acceleration. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.